Let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 11. Tonight we're going to cover Jeremiah chapters 11 and 12. And as uh, Pastor Lars mentioned, it's a little bit of a break for us after this. We're going to go in a season of home groups. So we look back with anticipation when we come back to the book of Jeremiah. And really, maybe it's a bit of a good thing that we have this break in the book of Jeremiah because Jeremiah is a little bit like a sledgehammer, isn't it? It hits us again and again. I, I, half joking, uh, somebody came in tonight and I said, I hope you're not depressed already coming in because it's, a, you know, it's the book of Jeremiah. Now, half joking because we're going to see some profound hope in the book of Jeremiah here tonight. But nevertheless, it, it is a gloomy book by and large because it's dealing with Judah, the southern kingdom, when they were so deserving of the judgment of God and where Jeremiah was used of God to warn them of the coming judgment, number one, in hopes that they might repent and avert the judgment, and number two, is that a godly remnant would be prepared for it when it happened. That's what we're going to take a look at tonight. Father, we pray for your blessing upon your word. We believe it, Lord. We believe that the grass um, withers, that the flower fades, but the word of our God, it stands forever. And so we want to prepare our hearts to receive right now In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 11, beginning now at verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, so you shall be my people and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. And I answered and said, So Be it, Lord. So much of the ministry of Jeremiah took place during the reign of a king named Josiah. And one of the difficult parts in studying and teaching the book of Jeremiah is that we are not given many chronological marking points to where we can say with any kind of certainty, he preached this sermon in this year. He preached this sermon during the reign of one of these kings. But one of the things we do know was that during the reign of King Josiah, there was a rediscovery of the law of God. And when they rediscovered the law of God, they read it and they realized how far short they had fallen from from, uh, obeying and doing what God told them to do. Now, I have a feeling that this section from the book of Jeremiah, and again, we can't prove it, we don't know for sure, but I have a sense that this particular section did not come from the period of Josiah, but maybe 10 or 20 years after that, when the people had again forgotten the law and forgotten the covenant that God made with the people. Because look at what it says right there in verse 1. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah. You see, God spoke to Judah about their failure to keep the ancient covenant that God made with the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt and when they came to Mount Sinai. Now, the details of that covenant are found in Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. But actually, throughout the book of Exodus, and in particular, the book of Deuteronomy speaks about the covenant and the blessings for obeying the covenant and the curses for disobeying it. And we almost have the feeling, at least as the movie plays in my mind, the prophet Jeremiah, when he's giving this message publicly, he's holding a scroll of Deuteronomy in his hand. And he's saying, this covenant, this is the covenant that you're neglecting. This is what you're not obeying. And this is what you will pay a terrible price for because you are ignoring the covenant. Matter of fact, look at verse 3. You could just picture him holding the scroll when he says these words in verse 3. Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. You see, when Israel made this covenant with God at Mount Sinai, there were specific curses pronounced upon those people who violated the covenant. And there were specific blessings pronounced upon those people who obeyed. And here God simply promised, I'm going to enforce the terms of this covenant. I'm going to do what we promised. You as a nation voluntarily entered into this covenant with me and you committed you and your descendants to this covenant. 
I will simply be faithful to keep up my end of the covenant. And part of that was curses for those who disobey. But notice this, there's also the note in these first four verses about God trying to instill a sense of gratitude in them. Did you notice what he said in verse 4? He said, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. God says, listen, this is what I did for you, Israel. Don't forget what I did for you in bringing you out of Egypt. Now, don't you think for somebody who lived in the days of Jeremiah which was six or seven hundred years after the time that they came out of Egypt. Don't you think it would, pretty be, it would be pretty easy to forget what God did? To not be appreciating it anymore? I mean, I don't know about you, but it's pretty easy for us to forget about what God did six or seven years ago, much less six or seven hundred years ago. What God was trying to say was, never forget what I did for you. Before I asked you to do anything I worked in your life. Don't think that you have to do good things so that I will work in your life. I have already worked in your life. I delivered you from the iron furnace of Egypt and I brought you into the land. Now in light of that, don't you think that you should have an attitude of obedience towards me? Friends, we must never get this mixed up in our minds. We don't obey God in order to make him love us or bless us, or, 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 or do good things on our behalf. No, that's never the idea. Instead, God is always the initiator. He gives first. He blesses us. He extends his deliverance towards us, and we respond with the appreciation of obedience. That's how it's to be among God's people. And look at what he did for them. In verse 5, it says, I gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. God fulfilled all his obligations under the covenant, and he simply says to Israel, look at how I blessed you. Regard it with an attitude of appreciation and live in obedience to me. Now he continues on in verse 6 where he says, Then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil hearts. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. Again, Jeremiah had a specific assignment. Did you see what that was in verse 6? In verse 6 he mentions, Proclaim all the words in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, take this message and go out on the road with it. I want everybody to hear. I want everybody to see this covenant. And again, I picture Jeremiah holding a scroll of the, book of, Jer- of the book of Deuteronomy in his hand. This covenant, this is what I did for you. This is the agreement that we made. And you have broken it. And this was part of the way that God came to Israel again and again. Look at what it says in verse 7. He says, For I earnestly exhorted your fathers. You know, look, we, we need to be honest. Jeremiah is a book that warns about terrible judgment that's to come upon the kingdom of Judah and the people of God. Terrible judgment. But nobody should think for a moment that it says, Oh, God has a short fuse. Oh, it's really easy to make God angry. Oh, isn't God quickly annoyed? Or doesn't he quickly lose patience with his people? Never. God says, I warned you again and again and again. But friends, just like any parent with a teenage child could tell you, there comes a time for the warnings to end. And action needs to be taken. But nobody should think that it's because God has some kind of short fuse or is is lacking in mercy. No, not at all. Verse 8 kind of spells out it. He says, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, he says, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant. I'm just going to do what I promised. But did you notice this phrase a little earlier in verse 8? God says, they're all following the dictates of their evil heart. Have we not seen this week after week in the book of Jeremiah? That the illness of Judah and the people of God is described as this. They followed their heart. That's the whole message of the culture to every human being today, isn't it? You want to be happy? Follow your heart. You want to find fulfillment? Follow your heart. 
And that's what, every, listen, there needs to be a little bit less following of your, no, let me rephrase it. There needs to be a lot less following your own heart. And there needs to be a complete following of the Lord God. Because you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that if you kind of put away the idea of following your heart and replace it with another biblical idea, which we might call dying to self, and instead of following your own heart, you say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow the God that's revealed to me in the God-man Jesus. When you find that you do that, you'll find that your heart overflows with happiness and peace. Isn't that strange? You're never going to gain it by making it your focus. But rather putting your focus on God, that's where you gain the things that are supposed to be gained through following your heart. So look at it here now, verse 9. And the Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned their back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my word. And they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers. I find that line in verse 9 pretty fascinating. Did you see that? A conspiracy has been found. God told Jeremiah that the men of Judah and Jerusalem organized a conspiracy. Now, I think that perhaps this was not a conspiracy on a human level. Maybe, humanly speaking, it was not a conscious conspiracy. Maybe there was not a society to rebel against God with a formal membership and people pay dues and, you know, you get a membership card and, you know, you have to swear an initiation oath. Do we really have to do that? You know, friends, even if there is not a conspiracy on a human level, is it not true that there is a conspiracy on a dark spiritual level? Because the Bible says this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of wickedness in high places we battle against spiritual foes demonic spirits who are in league with satan himself who want to hold back or destroy or defeat god's work to whatever extent that they can friends there is that kind of conspiracy that kind of conspiracy is alive and well i don't consider myself a conspiracy theorist but that kind of conspiracy, you better believe I believe in it. There is a dark conspiracy among spiritual forces of wickedness in this world. And they will use whatever human mouthpieces or vessels or instruments or opinion makers that they possibly can. And that's why God tells us no to have nothing to do with such things. And look, here's evidence of this conspiracy, whether they were conscious of it or not. Verse 10. They have turned their back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. You see, this conspiracy was a work both breaking the commandments of God, but especially in refusing to hear the warnings of God. Friends, I am far more concerned about someone who won't hear the warnings of God than I am concerned about a person who simply sins. We sin. And there is a rich reservoir of mercy and forgiveness with our God and Father for the sinner. Jesus Christ died on the cross to cleanse us from our sin. But the real problem is when we will not listen to God and respond to his invitation to receive that cleansing. That's the person who's in great danger. And so they turn their back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear the words of God. And now here's the curse that's going to come upon these covenant breakers. Look at it here in verse 11. He says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which way they will not be able to escape. And although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods whom they offer incense, but they will not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah. And according to the number of your streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. So do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. 
but see, because of their persistent rebellion. Because whenever God tried to warn them, they put their ear, hands over their ears, so to speak. They would not listen. Because of these things, God says to them, verse 11, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And then he points out the severity of their idolatry. Did you notice that in the verses? Where he says, listen, uh, you people in Jerusalem, verse 12, go and cry out to the gods whom you offer incense, but they're not going to save you. Go ahead. You've lived your life for um, uh, success. You've lived your life for materialism. You, you've lived your life for these idolatrous gods that we worship in our day and age today. And you're tied in trouble. Why don't you go get help from them? You'll find that they really can't help you, can they? It's only the living God. And this is the great tragedy of idolatry in our own day and age and in the ancient world as well. That's why God says, because of their rebellion, verse 14, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me. I won't hear them. Oh, they'll cry out to me. But isn't that a painful judgment from God? Ladies and gentlemen, do any of us want to be in that situation? We're simply, we would cry out to God in our time of need, and God says, sorry, I won't listen. You haven't listened to me. Why shall I now listen to you? I will not hear you. Friends, we do not want to be in this place, because I believe of all the curses that might come upon a people, surely one of the most terrible curses is the silence of God in our moment of need. We do not want God to be silent to us in our moment of need. How do we avoid this? Well, friends, I'll just give you one thought to consider. Do whatever you can to keep short accounts with God. Do you understand what that means? You know, think, think of you having a ledger before God, and when you sin, you know, you increase the ledger. Keep very short accounts. And how do you pay off the account? Well, the account is only paid at one place. It's at the cross. But in confession and repentance, you consciously bring those sins to the cross for Jesus' perfect payment. You keep short accounts with God. And this is a way to avoid this hardness of heart that would make anybody end up into the place where, where they'd never listen. I, Ingle and I were watching a movie a few weeks ago, and it's not even relevant what the name of the movie was. But in the movie, there was this guy sort of battling nature and all this. And the guy didn't believe in God. You know, in the script they had it, how he denies that there's ever a God. And he thinks the thought of God is very foolish and on and on and on. You know, it just, you know I, I wouldn't know, at least in the movie, didn't exactly describe him as a blasphemer. But he was certainly a man who had no place for God whatsoever in his life and probably never did. And then in a great moment of extremity, this man cries out to God. And he says, if you're there, answer. I really need you now. If you're there, answer me. And nothing happens. And matter of fact, in just a few moments, he finds himself to be in much worse trouble than he ever imagined that he ever was. And you know what? I, I can imagine somebody looking at that saying, how terrible. Well, I agree it's terrible, but it's well-deserved. Is anybody going to say that a man goes through his entire life rejecting and blaspheming God, and then at the last minute, he cries out to God, not in faith, no, he doesn't cry out to God in faith. God will receive anybody who comes to him in faith. But he cries out to God in utter unbelief and says, well, maybe if you're out there, prove yourself to me. And God is obligated to answer? No, I'm not saying that God won't answer. Perhaps God will, but if he did, it would be pure mercy. Nothing other than the mercy of God. God would have absolutely no obligation to answer that man. And maybe he would. I pray that God is merciful to all people. I want him to be merciful unto me. But nobody should think for a moment that God is under any kind of obligation to answer a person who has blasphemed him his entire life. Especially when that person does not call out in faith, but he calls out actually in utter unbelief of God. Well, this is sort of what we see reflected in these verses. Now, if you think God is being a little rough, I, I think he is too. So God is always careful to show, and I don't know if I'm phrasing this right, I don't want to be irreverent, but God is showing his tender side, beginning at verse 15. Look at this with me. What has my beloved to do in my house, having done lewd deeds with many? 
and the holy flesh is passed from you. When you do evil, then you rejoice. The Lord God called your name green olive tree, lovely and good fruit. The noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. Verse 15, God says, I still regard you as my beloved, but I recognize that you've been completely unfaithful to me. What has my beloved to do in my house having done lewd deeds with many? But what are you doing in my house? You're not faithful to me, God says to Judah. You've been a very unfaithful to us and that you want to come back to my house. Yet I still call you my beloved. If you would come back in repentance, things could be different, but they do not. Matter of fact, look at how bad it is. Verse 15, when you do evil, then you rejoice. Friends, this is the description of a sin-sick society. And could not that description be said in our own day and age? Couldn't you take a substantial portion of the entertainment industry and put this verse over it? When you do evil, then you rejoice. Couldn't you take a large proportion of the internet and write that over it? When you do evil, then you rejoice. So what's to be done in such a situation? Look at the pain that God has here in verse 16. He says, the Lord has called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. It's like pet names that God would use for Judah. It describes that you're my green olive tree. Oh, I looked for good fruit on you. Oh, you were so tender to me. There was such a, a, a relationship there at one time. But now, look at it, verse 16. He has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. Gone is the beautiful, sweet green olive tree. And now judgment has come upon it. Well, with verse 18, we have a little bit of a shift. Because now the shift is so much God speaking to Judah. That's kind of put in the background now. Now beginning at verse 18, Jeremiah is going to tell us about a little thing going on in his life. Ready for this? Verse 18. Now the Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I know it, for you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut off from the land, cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. All right, let's unpack this just a little bit. Verse 18 tells us that the Lord gave Jeremiah knowledge of something. In other words, he would not have known it unless God gave him knowledge of it. And what was it that God gave him knowledge of? Well, whatever it was, it was pretty serious because look at verse 19. I was like a docile lamb led to the slaughter. This was Jeremiah's state before God warned him. And we use that phrase like a lamb to the slaughter? This is where we get that phrase from. As a matter of fact, what was it? Verse 19, I did not know that they had devised schemes against me. You see, before God warned him, Jeremiah was defenseless before God, and he was ready to be cut down like a tree. So what is he going to do? Take a look at it here in verse 20. But, O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have revealed my cause. I don't know if you like to mark your Bible or put bookmarks in your electronic Bible, but you might want to bookmark verse 20 right there. Do you know what verse 20 is? It's a great prayer for the persecuted. Basically, it's God thump them really hard. But at the same time, it's leaving the vengeance in the hands of the Lord, is it not? Jeremiah's not going to take it on himself. He says, first of all, verse 20, but you, O Lord of hosts, he takes comfort in that, that's the God of heavenly armies, you who judge righteously, testing the mind of heart. You see, Jeremiah prayed for protection, but he didn't ask to be shielded as an evildoer. Lord, if I'm in sin in the midst of this, deal with me in it. I want you to deal righteously. And oftentimes, that's a great big difference, isn't it? We can be in a dispute, and we can say, God, take my cause, take my side, God, instead of Lord, take the side of what's right. And as much as I'm right, 
then take my side. Wherever I'm wrong, speak to me where I'm wrong. Do you see the difference between the two? And then he says this in verse 20. Let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have revealed my cause. God, your vengeance. I call it out for you to take the vengeance. Now, God made a promise here in verse 21. Check it out. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth, or Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring catastrophe on the men of Anathoth, even in the year of their punishment. Wow! So now we know something of the place where these men were from. These men are from Anathoth. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Jeremiah 1.1 tells us that Jeremiah was from Anathoth. This is his hometown. This is where he grew up. This is where he went to preschool and grade school and high school. It's his own guys. It's his own family, its own friends. They are the ones with this conspiracy out to get him. You see, this was Jeremiah's own home, and it was the people of his own village who wanted to kill him. It says in verse 21, Thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth who seek your life. They're the ones who put the bullseye on the back of Jeremiah. And what did they tell him to do? Look at verse 21. Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. This is the threat that they made against him. You better stop doing your work as a prophet, Jeremiah. Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord. We don't want to hear it anymore. You better stop this work. And what does God say? Verse 22. Behold, I will punish them. Don't you worry about it, Jeremiah. I'm going to take care of you, and I am going to punish them. Now, chapters 11 and 12 go together very well. They just go move seamlessly one to another. So keep this thought in mind that Jeremiah is troubled by the thought that men from his own village have a contract out on him. Men from his own village are threatening him and saying, you better stop prophesying in the name of the Lord or we will kill you, okay? This is the whole situation. This is causing Jeremiah some trouble. That's why he says in chapter 12, verse 1, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yeah, let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You've planted them, yes, they have taken root. They grow, yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But you, O Lord, know me. You've seen me. And you've tested my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. And prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there. Because they said, he will not see our final end. Doesn't this sound a little bit familiar? This is another one of those passages of Scripture where a writer in the Bible, like Job, like Asaph in Psalm 73, those are two notable examples I can think of. Like Job, like Asaph in Psalm 73, the question is asked, why do the wicked prosper? Why do the wicked prosper and the righteous often seem to have it bad? And you know what I find interesting? When Job asked that question... God didn't really answer him. When Jeremiah asks that question, God doesn't really answer him. We'll see that in just a few moments. If you want the answer to the question, make a note in your Bible. Look up later Psalm 73 where Asaph asked that question. Psalm 73, Asaph was tortured by this understanding, why do the wicked prosper? Why do they seem to have it so good? Why do the righteous seem to suffer? And then he says this, and then I went into the house of the Lord, and I saw their end. Do you see the difference? You see, then he had some understanding. Then he had peace. Then he came to the place of understanding. You know what? They may have it pretty good in this life, but in eternity, God settles the scores. In eternity, God makes all things right. And friends, this is our great confidence. Look. 
Many times on this earth, God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. But the ultimate issue of reward and punishment is resolved in eternity. And therefore, let's face it, there are people who are wicked and seem perfectly happy and prosperous and they die peacefully in their bed. You may say, well then, what's the good of what we do? No, God settles it in eternity. And there are other very righteous people who endure a lot of misery and sometimes needless suffering. And we wonder, God, what's wrong with this situation? God says, no, we're playing not just for this small sliver of time that in your total existence makes up this life. We're playing for eternity. Now, but what I want to stress to you is God doesn't really give this answer to Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah phrases the question as kindly as he can. Did you see that in verse 1? He begins, righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Oh God, I praise you, you're wonderful, but but Lord, uh, can we just have a little chat about how you're running things around here? And then he asks, verse 1, why does the way of the wicked prosper? That's the question. As a matter of fact, he makes the question even worse in verse 2 when he says, you have planted them. God, look, I know that at least you have allowed their prosperity. Even if you did not directly cause it, there's no doubt that you have allowed their prosperity. What am I to do this? You have planted them. This is a problematic issue. And they don't honor you. Look at verse 2 where it says, you are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But he says, but you, verse 3, you, O Lord, you know me. You've seen me and you've tested my heart towards you. I contrast my life with their life and I wonder, God, what are you doing? Then he gives God a little helpful suggestion did you notice a helpful suggestion in verse three pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter that's just a suggestion god but that's what i'd like you to do with them remember just at the end of chapter 11 how he felt like a lamb to the slaughter don't you see he's saying i want them to feel that way i want them to experience the same thing so this is the state of his heart now if you want god's answer to jeremiah which doesn't directly answer his question. I think it answers his need, but it doesn't answer his question. Do you understand that there can be a difference between the two? That God can answer your need without necessarily answering your question. So look at how he answers his need. Verse 5, God speaks to Jeremiah. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, in which you trusted, they wearied you, how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. Friends, do you see what he's getting at in verse 5? If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how then can you contend with the horses? You see, God's answer to Jeremiah was both powerful and profound without directly answering the question. Again, if you want to answer to the question, go to Psalm 73. But without directly answering the question, God encouraged Jeremiah to regard his present challenge as a preparation for what was going to be needed from him in the future. See, Jeremiah was certainly in a challenge. Death threat from your own uh, village challenge? Yes, I think we can agree on that. He wasn't making up a problem. Jeremiah was certainly in a challenge. It was like a hard foot race with the footmen. There was a sense of spiritual and mental and emotional exertion involved with the persecution that was coming from his fellow villagers in Anathoth and the questions regarding the prosperity of the wicked. Lord, this is tough. It's tormenting me. And you know what God basically said to him? Dude, you haven't seen anything yet. You think this is tough? Here's the encouraging word I have for you, Jeremiah. There's worse stuff down the way. You're having a tough time running with the footmen? All right, let me tell you, there's horses in your future. You, You better man up. You better realize that as tough as it is now, what I'm doing in you right now is gonna prepare you for a greater challenge that you have to face in the future. You see, God appreciated the challenge. He wasn't trying to tell Jeremiah that what you're going through is nothing. It's hard to run a race. It is against footmen. He says, no, 
later on, you're going to be running against the horses. You see, there were greater challenges to come. By analogy, Jeremiah could expect to run against horses in the future. And he needed to learn how to trust God and to draw on his strength in the present challenge in order to prepare him for what was going to come in the future. Listen, Jeremiah, you think it's tough now in Anathoth? Wait till you face people who want to murder you on the streets of Jerusalem. You think it's now tough in Judah? Wait till you have to go to Egypt and Babylon and Syria. You think it's tough now? Wait until they put you in the stocks. That's later on in the book of Jeremiah. Wait till they throw you in a cistern of a prison. Wait until there's even more conspiracies against your life. Friends, it's coming. It's coming. That was God's warning to Jeremiah. So, That's why God told him, do not believe them, verse 6, even though they speak smooth words to you. The open adversity was another part of the smaller challenge. The bigger challenge was going to come when people spoke smooth words to him. Father, everybody's criticizing me. Everybody's slamming me. I don't know what to do about it. And God says this, oh yeah? Well, at least they're opposing you to your face. Wait till people speak smooth words to you and want to stab you in the back. That's a real challenge that you got to prepare for. And that was the analogy with uh, Jeremiah right there. So now, verse 7. We, we kind of shift into another focus here. Now God is speaking to the people once again. He, he's not speaking so much directly personally to Jeremiah, but through Jeremiah. He says at verse 7, I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I've hated it. My heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. You know what's interesting? The tribe of Judah in Jacob's great prophecy at the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 49. The tribe of Judah is likened to a lion. And God says, you're like a lion, but you're a lion roaring against me. You're like a lion that wants to attack me. You're not like a proud, noble lion like you should be in the tribe of Judah. And so God says, you're rebelling against me. Why are you doing this? Verse 10, many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trotted my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They've made it desolate. Desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. The plunderers have come of all the desolate heights in the wilderness for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat but reaped Thorns, they have put themselves to pain, but do not profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Do you see that note going again and again in verse 11? They have made it desolate, desolate. It mourns to me. When the judgment comes upon the land of Judah, it will make the land desolate because no one will take it to heart And it will mourn because of that. You know, it's kind of interesting, and this can't be owed only to the Babylonian um, invasion that Jeremiah specifically prophesied about. But Israel was at time, was at one time, a much more vegetated and lush and wooded country than it was just 50 years ago. It was made, in many places, a desert and a wasteland by the invading armies that came through. Now, the Israelis, very wisely and very proactively, as they are, they've tried to reclaim as much of that as they can. They've planted millions of trees all over Israel. They're trying to reclaim wilderness lands. It's really a beautiful thing that they've done. But when you go to Israel today and see so much of it being rocky and desolate and barren, it wasn't all like that, or as much like that, Even in the fairly recent past, but it was invading armies that distripped the land of its vegetation. Verse 14. Thus says the Lord, 
against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be, after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. Whoa, red alert. There's a glimmer of hope here in Jeremiah. Check this out in these two verses. Do you see what God's saying? First of all, God promises this, that he will deal with the nation that comes and brings judgment upon Judah. You know, this was a problem for some of the later prophets. Some of the later prophets complained to the Lord, and I'll paraphrase their ideas. They said basically this, Lord, I know Judah's really bad. We deserve judgment. But to bring it to us by the Babylonians, they're worse than we are. That's not right. And basically God said to the prophets, don't you worry about that. I'm in control here. And don't regard me using the Babylonians to bring judgment upon you as a sign that I like the Babylonians. Oh no, I'm going to deal with them. And that's what he promises here. He says, notice this, verse 14, I will pluck them out of their land. God wanted those who would attack and exile Israel. He says, I'm going to dispossess you of your land in time. I'm going to use you as an instrument of my judgment, but don't regard that as being in my favor. I will deal with you in due time. And then he says in verse 14, don't miss those words, and I will pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Judah's off in exile in Babylon. God says, I will pluck them out, or more properly, a remnant from them. I will pluck them out, and I will put them back in the land. Judah. You're going to be a subject to the Babylonian armies. They're going to invade. They're going to wipe you out. They're going to exile you. have been reading this again and again. And he goes, but I am going to restore you. I will bring you back into the land. Friends, do you realize what a great hope this is? Verse 15, I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back. Everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. I'll do this, God says. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back into your land. Oh, I've disciplined you, Judah, but not forever. I will bring you back because I can never forsake or cast off my people Israel. I must discipline them. I must exile them, but I am not finished with them in my great plan of the ages, and I must bring them back into the land. And that's what he did under Ezra and Nehemiah and in the great return from exile described in the Old Testament. Friends, isn't this a great lesson for you and I? There's nobody too far gone. Maybe you feel that God has cast you off. Maybe you feel like you're in exile, that God has just booted you out. And you know what? Maybe there's something in your conscience that tells you, I deserved it. Judah deserved it. Maybe you deserved it. But God says to you, I will pluck you out of your exile, and I can and will bring you back matter of fact the promise gets a little bit better than that look at these last two verses verses 16 and 17 it says this and it shall be if they will learn carefully now he's talking about the pagan nations now if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the lord lives as they taught my people to swear by baal then they shall be established in the midst of my people and if they do not obey i'll utterly pluck up and destroy that nation says the lord do you see what he says in verse 16? There's a promise for restoration even unto the Babylonians and the pagans. If they'll only turn to the Lord. If they will learn carefully the ways of my people, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. I'll do this. I'll bring them. In other words, God wants to make it clear. It's not a racial thing with Israel. It's a covenant thing. And nations that want to come and honor Yahweh and become part of the covenant, God says, I will receive them if they will forsake their gods and come unto me. This promise of restoration was not made only to the people of Israel. It was even made to the Gentiles who would come and honor the God of Israel. This tells us something profound. It tells us something that we should never forget. There is nobody too far gone. God can come and rescue and redeem, and he's been doing it ever since. But I have to end, this is the book of Jeremiah, by the way, I have to end with verse 17. But if they do not obey, 
I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation. Look, I'd love to tell you on and on and on about the great promise of restoration that God gives. I'll bring you back from your exile. I'll pluck you up. I'll bring you back from all that calamity. I want to do that. I'd love to talk on and on about that, but I do need to add this. If you reject God's invitation to come back and be restored, you're going to be destroyed. What else can God do? Lord, I didn't listen to you the first time. You put me in this great place of discipline. And now I hear that if I'll only trust in you, if I'll turn to you, then I will be restored. Yes, Lord, but I don't want it. Forget it. Have you not sealed your own doom when you say that? So the greatness of the promise of restoration raises the price for rejecting it. Father, we pray that you would make us a people who can keep short accounts with you. Lord, I think there's not a person in this room who harbors the dream of being perfect before you. Lord, there's one perfect man, and that's the man Jesus Christ. But Lord, when we fail, when we fall short, Help us to keep very short accounts with you so that, Lord, um, we'll continue to listen, we'll continue to be sensitive, and, Lord, we can live and walk in that perpetual hope of restoration and be able to present it to others. Help us with that, Lord, we pray, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.